Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure um, to be the moderator for this session. So the first plenary session for today is the Professor David Cooper Memorial Lecture. And I'm sure you all know David very, very well. David was an eminent Australian immunologist, the founding director of the National Center in HIV Epidemiology and Clinical Research, now the Kirby Institute at the University of New South Wales, Australia. He was also one of the founding co-directors of HIVNAT. David's life was dedicated to the prevention and treatment of HIV and other infectious diseases. And he contributed to the development of almost every drug used in HIV treatment to date. I cannot think of a better person to give this memorial lecture than Professor Tony Kelleher. Tony is an excellent clinical immunologist and laboratory scientist. He is the current director of the Kirby Institute. Tony has an outstanding reputation in the field of immunology and HIV research and played a key role in multiple clinical trials. His research spans from the basic science of HIV pathogenesis to HIV preventive vaccine development to HIV treatment and more recently to the block and lock strategy for HIV remission. The title of his talk is Future Directions for HIV Therapies. Thank you, Tony. And it is a great honour, as always, to, to be at this symposium, which I, I think is a, an incredible initiative that's now run for the last 22 years. Uh, and it's an incredible honour to, uh, in, uh, to be giving this uh, David Cooper Memorial Lecture. And I think it's uh, somewhat humbling to be introduced by what I think, uh, by one of the people who I think is one of the emerging leaders in the field. So David, as Denise has just said, was an inspirational leader. He was a mentor and a friend. He was first and foremost a clinician scientist. He believed in data, not expert opinion, and he spent his research career ensuring that, that that data was gathered in a high quality way. And that really has underpinned much of the strategic use of antiretroviral therapy for the treatment of AIDS uh, that is still used today. He believed in health as a human right and believed in treatment access for all. And he pursued this vigorously in many guises, but in particular when he was president of the International AIDS Society. And he was committed to this region and particularly to capacity building. And he was incredible at identification and support at, of talent and growing that talent to ensure the next generation. And there is a picture of uh, the three amigos uh, who really underpin uh, the fact that we're here for the 22nd time. So these are my conflicts of interest. So, as I've just said, antiretroviral drugs have revolutionized the treatment of HIV. Those drugs hold back the virus, they hold it in check, and they allow, allow immune reconstitution if you start antiretroviral therapy late and immune preservation if you start it early. And what we've learned over the last five to 10 years is that these same therapeutics are very, very good at preventing HIV in the form of PrEP but compliance is an issue. So what does the future hold? Well, there will be further advances in these antiretroviral therapies. New classes are coming online, and there, is, uh, the, uh, there are currently many trials looking at long-acting antiretroviral therapy, both for treatment and for PrEP. And these will be dealt with by eminent speakers later in the program. These Advances will be, will be important for both compliance and choice. And the other major advances that need to occur in the future are uh, those of access uh, to therapy. And they also will be dealt with extensively in the program. So I've chosen to look a little bit beyond the immediate event horizon and try and uh, give you some uh, background on where the laboratory is meeting uh, the clinic uh, in a translational uh, fashion uh, to try and look at uh, ways where we might advance 
both the cure and remission strategies and the control of residual morbidities that still afflict uh, patients infected with HIV. Uh, and in this uh, talk, I'm not going to deal with immune activation, but I'm going to talk about the rise of immunotherapy for malignancy, which we've seen uh, outside the HIV field, and how this might impact on the residual morbidities we see in virally driven cancers. So to deal with the reservoir first, uh, HIV in the reservoir is in what we call a latent state. And most of this virus is in a form called post-integration latency. What does that mean? It means that the virus is in its DNA form, integrated into the human genome. It's there, but it's silent. It's not transcribing, it's not making RNA. And importantly, the key thing to understand is that that gene expression from HIV, from the genes of HIV, is driven much like the, by, like any other gene, it's driven by the activity of promoters that sit in front of those genes. And in HIV, this promoter is referred to as the 5' prime LTR, or long terminal repeat. What are the mechanisms of latency? There is this thing called epigenetic silencing. So all genes are associated with histone structures within uh, the genome uh, that are based on histone architecture, such as nucleosomes. And the HIV LTR is no different, and it has a very particular histone architecture associated with that, that I will go into in some more detail in a moment. But the transcription of HIV is controlled by the deacetylation and methylation of those histones, which change the biochemical properties of those histones and their architecture. And epigenetic silencing uh, also arises from sequestra sequestration of ho host transcription factors and viral factors such as TAT that regulate uh, viral transcription uh, a latent virus may be latent because it's integrated into a silent gene. And you say, well, how does that happen? HIV preferentially integrates into active genes, but those genes may be active in a particular cell, and as that cell goes into a resting state or differentiates, those genes become resting. And so as those genes become resting, the uh, virus also goes into a resting or latent state. Well, the virus may appear to be latent and unable to transcribe, but it's in fact defective because it has a stop code on or it has an insertion or a deletion that makes it replication incompetent and unable to transcribe. So this diagram looks very scary, but it basically shows the whole genome of HIV with the 5' prime LTR expanded here. And these Gray and pink structures shown here are the histones formed into nucleosomes associated with the 5' prime LTR. And there are always two of these. There's NUC0 and NUC1, not very imaginative names. And importantly, NUC1 sits over the transcription start site. And in fact, it's well demonstrated uh, in uh, this retrovirus and also in HTLV1 that particularly changes in this, uh, the architecture of this histone, th this nucleosome uh, 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 changes the orientation of this uh, nucleosome and actually it slides up and down uh, the 5' prime LTR revealing the transcription start site and allowing the virus to transcribe. The 5' prime LTR also uh, contains all these uh, host transcription factor binding sites that regulate HIV transcription. And as you can see there's multiple different ones, each shown here is a different colour. The important thing, the basic way to think about this, is if you get methylation of these histones, you get a closed chromatin architecture and the virus is unlikely to be transcribing. If you get acetylation of these histones, you get an open chromatin structure, you get sliding of this nucleosome to reveal the transcription start site, and you get active transcription of the virus. And this biology has underpinned the shock and kill approach, which we've heard about 
uh, at this uh, symposium and elsewhere, uh, particularly from uh, lectures given at, plenary lectures given at previous symposiums by people like Sharon Lewin. And Sharon and others have pursued this shock and kill approach, which is really based on giving various small molecule uh, inhibitors that change the uh, profile of those histones from one that's dominated by methylation to one that's dominated by acetylation to try and encourage trans transcription of the virus, have the virus produce its proteins, and then that those cells that are producing active virus be killed either directly by the immune system or by things like uh, neutralizing antibodies that are given at the same time. A less well-studied approach uh, is something that we have been pursuing for quite some time called block, block and lock. And the idea here is really to uh, do exactly the opposite, is the simplest way to think about it. So you can use various things like sRNAs and short hairpin RNAs, which I'll concentrate in this uh, talk, but other small molecule inhibitors and TAT mimics to actually shut down viral transcription to hopefully induce something that we've called super latency that is resistant to host uh, factor activation and lock the virus down into a, uh, a uh, silent state that is maintained for long periods of time. So this is what we're trying to do with our SI, SHRNAs. So we, we found to our surprise some time ago that if you uh, take SI, SHRNAs that are aimed at the promoter of the virus, the 5' LTR, that match sequences with certain sequences within that promoter, you can change this open chromatin structure to this closed chromatin structure in the virus and you can shut transcription down. So we have identified two lead candidates, which we call PROM-A and SH143, which bind to this area here, which happens to be the same area as the important transcription factor NF-kappa-B binds. And we've found another one that's associated with NUC0 that binds to the, near to the AP1 binding site, which is another important host transcription factor that activates HFV transcription. Importantly, these sequences are relatively highly conserved across various subtypes of the virus and do not have similar sequences within the host genome. So we try to maximize on-target effects and minimize off-target effects. We've got two of these lead candidates, but we've done a screen of this whole 5' LTR, and we have about uh, 10 of these that look promising. And we found that doing some mathematical modeling that if we have four of these in combination, we can cover in excess of 99% of the variants that are described in the Los Alamos database. So what happens when you treat a culture with these? Well, the red and the blue, the green line here uh, shows the effects of uh, these two sRNAs, and these are various controls up here, which I'm not going to go to, through. But basically, uh, without these, you get lots of virus. With these, you get very little virus. If you, this is shown by P20, or by RT, root burst transcriptase here. But if we measure this by RNA, we get a three to four log drop in virus with uh, one of these and it lasts for one treatment with an sRNA in vitro, lasts between 16 and 21 days. So we get profound and uh, prolonged silencing of the virus, which is specific with minimal off-target effects. And we found that we can induce this in multiple T-cell lines, in monocyte-derived macrophages, and in astrocytes. Importantly, if you do the same sorts of cultures, but try and activate the virus with things like varinostat, which is one of these HDAC inhibitors that has been used to in the um, uh, shock and kill approach, or TNF, which is a, a tumor necrosis factor which activates the virus. We can maintain silencing of the virus with uh, either of our sRNAs, this is 143, this is PROM-A, and this is the combination, uh, 
even at very high uh, concentrations of these, well above what, we, uh, what is being used in the clinic for um, reactivation and well above what we see, the levels of TNF that we see in septic shock. So that's fine, that's all in tissue culture and petri dishes. Uh, we've, we've, we want to demonstrate this in vivo and we decided to do this in skid hue mice because in skid hue mice, these mice are reconstituted with a human immune system and you can use HIV, whereas going into macaques, we would have to use different sequences and different delivery constructs to get it effectively into the macaques. So we reconstitute these skid mice, these immunodeficient mice, with a human immune system, either using human CD4 cells or human CD34 stem cells. We allow those to engraft, and then we challenge the mice with virus. And so this is uh, some of the results of those experiments, and you can show, this is, again, a measure of virus, the amount of P24 the virus is producing, and you get significant reductions in this very acute uh, uh, model of HIV infection, these mice, without treatment, die within about four weeks in this model, so it's very uh, aggressive HIV infection. You get uh, reductions in tissues of uh, the amount of virus, and you get maintenance of CD4 T cells at the same level as mice that are uninfected. So, uh, Taking a lesson from what we know about uh, antiretroviral therapy, we have pursued a combination approach in uh, collaboration with an industry partner called Calimune, who's recently been associated with CSL in Australia, who have an siRNA that knocks down CCR5, the co-receptor for HIV. And we've combined the delivery of uh, this SH, this short hairpin RNA that knocks down CCR5 and prevents viral entry that way with our SH RNAs that induce silencing. So we're aiming at two stages of the virus life cycle. And this means that uh, you get both prevention of viral entry, any virus that gets in gets silenced, and any virus that's there before you've gone in with your uh, uh, gene therapy that prevents viral entry will also be silenced by the, uh, the S our siRNAs. So we think this makes biological sense. So we've set up a skid hue mouse model with our colleagues at uh, the Walter and Eliza Hall uh, in, in Melbourne, uh, where we uh, transplant uh, a, a different uh, group of, uh, a, a different strain of skid hue mice with CD34 cells that are transduced with uh, various constructs. They're allowed to engraft, we then infect uh, the mice with HIV, allow that infection to establish for about three weeks. We then treat them with antiretroviral therapy for a period and then we take them off therapy and we look at what happens to the viral load. And so this is uh, some preliminary results from these experiments. And you can see that this, this is now measuring the CD4 count in these mice. Uh, throughout each of those stages. And you can see that in uh, the two um, control groups, there is a decrease in CD4 T cells over time in the, uh, in the groups of mice. Whereas in the mice receiving the combined therapy, there is maintenance of CD4 T cells. There is also delay, though it's only minimal delay, uh, in the groups treated in terms of rebound of viral load. And the numbers are still, still small there and preliminary, uh, but we find this encouraging. The problem we have is that we need to get these uh, therapeutics that work into more CD4 T cells. Currently, we use a retroviral approach that transduces about 40 to 70% of the stem cells. We need to increase that and we need to get better entry into CD4 T cells. The current standard retroviral therapy uh, approach is to use uh, what we call VSVG uh, pseudotyped uh, retroviruses. And that makes sense for a lot of gene therapy, but it doesn't make sense for HIV. The receptor for VSVG does not exist on resting CD4 T cells. You have to activate the cells to get the 
the, uh, the, the virus in. And we don't want to reactivate the virus here. So we've pursued uh, various ways of trying to develop new gene therapies in parallel with the uh, new gene delivery uh, vehicles. And we've taken two approaches. We're trying to develop new retroviral constructs. Uh, and I'm going to show you some data from that now where we have screened, we've reasoned that envelope from HIV gets virus into cells very, very, these cells very, very well, so why not use envelope? And um, we've got, uh, we've screened a large number of envelopes. We found one that is dual tropic and has low CD4 dependence, and this gets into very significant numbers of resting CD4 T cells of all flavours, whether they be naive, effector, central memory, slightly less indeterminately differentiated. We also want to, once the virus is in, we want to get more of it integrated, and VPX is a gene in HIV2 that, and in SIV that increases the rate of, trans, uh, uh, of transport into the nucleus and integration uh, in resting cells, and particularly in monocytes and macrophages. And you can see that here that VPX increases the rate of transduction of our constructs very, very considerably. And we've screened a library of VPXs, and we found one that equally uh, supports entry, uh, uh, transduction of resting T cells and monocytes and macrophages, which are the main uh, 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 homes of the reservoir. And so we are now building a, uh, a retroviral construct where these two proteins are expressed in trans or into non-integrative constructs uh, to see if we can do better with our transduction efficiency using this retroviral approach. With our colleagues in, uh, at Melbourne University, uh, Frank Caruso and others, we are all pursuing a, a different line of delivery where we're using various sorts of nanoparticles. One of those is shown here, a layer by layer nanoparticle, which we can load up with our SI, SH RNAs. And this is, uh, these are some uh, fluorescent micro, uh, uh, pictures of, uh, of cells where blue is the nucleus, yellow is the virus, and uh, red is our sRNAs when they've been delivered by these um, nanoparticles. And just to show you that these are, in fact, inside the nucleus. So uh, this lump here is our sRNA embedded in the nucleus of a resting primary CD4 T cell. And without targeting these at all, we're getting about 15% uh, entry into the nucleus and suppression of the virus. So we're now trying to target those more efficiently uh, with uh, 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 antibodies and other uh, ligands that will target resting CD4 T cells. So uh, to finish this uh, section of the talk, I I think we've got a suite of SI, SH RNAs that target the promoter of HIV that cause profound and uh, prolonged silencing uh, in multiple cell types of the virus. Uh, and the latency that this induces is resistant to T cell activation. And so I'd put it to you that at least in vitro we can uh, induce this phenomenon called super latency. We have encouraging data in uh, at least two separate murine models now, uh, and, uh, but our challenge is really delivery. The delivery of this to uh, resting CD4 T cells is highly challenging, and we're, uh, we're investigating uh, building del better gene delivery sy systems, both by engineered retroviruses and layer-by-layer -layer nanoparticles. I wanted to change gear now and uh, talk about HPV infection uh, and anal cancer. Uh, so as we know, HPV causes uh, cervical cancer and other cancers, and anal cancer uh, in, is, uh, is analogous in many ways to cervical cancer. Infection of HPV causes increasing uh, dysplasia of the epithelial uh, cells, uh, in the uh, anal canal, uh, which becomes increasingly uh, dysplastic and eventually transforms uh, into uh, a, a cancer. Uh, 
there is very high prevalence of the high-grade forms of this intraepithelial neoplasia in gay men, uh, and uh, it's even higher in uh, men that are HIV positive. Uh, and this is uh, an increasing uh, problem that, uh, uh, that, and these infections are, are prevalent uh, throughout the world and particularly in, in this region. Uh, and the, the rate of uh, these infections and the rate of transformation into cancer is higher in those who are HIV positive. So this is a graph showing the prevalence of HPV infection in uh, gay and bisexual men. And you can see that uh, the, the uh, high risk subtypes are prevalent in uh, both HIV negative and uh, HIV positive men, and often uh, more prevalent in the HIV positive individuals uh, at very high rates. Uh, those data came from a study that was done in Australia called SPANK, where we followed 600 uh, gay and bisexual men uh, with anoscopy over a three-year period to look at the progression of disease. I want to describe here a sub-study that we did uh, about uh, the correlates of progression and regression of uh, high-grade disease uh, in this cohort. So we chose to look at uh, the immune responses in the periphery to two, the two oncoproteins uh, associated with HPV that are called E6 and E7. Uh, and we uh, did a range of T cell assays, including intracellular cytokine assays and our OX40 assay, where we look for the upregulation of two activation markers, CD134 and CD25, to look at CD4 T cell responses. Uh, and there's a lot of information on this uh, graph, but if you look at the uh, bottom corner here, what we found was that CD4 responses to E6, or the presence of those, uh, correlated with regression of disease. That was published some time ago, but it got us thinking about how we might manipulate this natural immune response uh, to encourage regress regression of disease. And so we took the opportunity uh, of the fact that uh, Spank was finishing its follow-up uh, and we design and, uh, our access to a drug called pomalidomide, which Mark Polizzotto at the Kirby had previously worked on at uh, NCI uh, with Bob Yarkwin and had demonstrated that pomalidomide could cause regression of treatment-resistant Kaposi's sarcoma which we know is a virally driven cancer. So we designed this single arm study called SPACE where we gave pomalidomide to uh, gay and bisexual men, whether they were HIV positive or negative, uh, uh, who had established uh, high grade uh, intraepithelial disease that was not regressing. So they were given uh, 21 days of pomalidomide uh, out of each 28-day cycle, and they received six of those cycles. So there were six months of therapy, three weeks on, one week off, and they got two milligrams of pomalidomide. Pomalidomide is a, uh, is a sister drug to the drug thalidomide and is currently licensed for the, uh, for, uh, the treatment of uh, myeloma and myelofibrosis. Uh, but in those, uh, in myeloma, it regulates B cell differentiation, uh, but it is known to have significant impacts on the T cell arm of the immune system. And so we argued that this is an orally uh, uh, available drug, relatively uh, well tolerated, uh, and we chose to look at its effect on the histological clearance of high grade disease uh, at anos anoscopy at six months and then repeat that at 12 months when uh, the, uh, the patients had been off therapy for another six months. Therapy for this condition at the moment is mostly local and not very effective. And so although you can burn or freeze these lesions off, they tend to recur very quickly. 
And so really that 12 month time point was to look at whether we were getting sustained responses or not of therapy. So this is the study uh, group. It was 26 men, they were aged about 50. Uh, they all had high grade disease and they'd all had that established for at least three years. So an average of 37 months. In the HIV, they were divided between HIV positive and HIV negative, and in those that were HIV positive, those, uh, they had 700 CD4 T cells and were all virally suppressed. These are the results which surprised us. Uh, we'd powered this to detect about a 15 to 20 percent regression rate. We got uh, regression rates of uh, 52 percent, uh, which were at least as good in the HIV positive men as the HIV negative men at six months. And this is the breakdown of complete and partial. And we got uh, that sustained at 12 months. In fact, some of those that were still had disease at six months uh, converted to regression at 12 months. So there was an ongoing uh, response after the withdrawal of the drug. And these are the waterfall plots of those two points shown here. So these are pretty impressive results. So along with that, we did a range of laboratory assays and showed that there was this really marked immune activation in both the CD4 and CD8 T cell compartments, which Mark and Irene Serretti had seen in the Kaposi sarcoma trial. So we replicated that. What they hadn't done was they hadn't done any functional studies and we show uh, that we get these really marked increases in the function of CD4 T cells, particularly in response to E6, but also in response to other viral antigens such as CMV. So we get these marked increases in both the response, but also in the background responses. So they, this is really inducing a lot of immune activation without any uh, severe side effects. And it causes uh, changes in CD4 and CD8 count and in the subsets, but all those changes are transient. And importantly, it doesn't drive out a senescence immune, senescent immune system. So we find this to be very encouraging data. We have uh, used pomalidomide, which is a well-tolerated orally av available immunotherapy and has shown now that this causes regression of two virally driven cancers, high-grade uh, anal intraepithelial neoplasia and Kaposi sarcoma. And this is associated with transient changes in the immune system, generalized immune activation and functional changes in the CD4 T cell uh, responses that we had previously shown correlated with uh, natural regression of the disease. So we're still in the process of characterizing the responses within the epithelium and subepithelial, and still trying to understand uh, how this actually uh, drives regression of the disease. But I think the discovery of these Im immunotherapies that are, are much better tolerated and appear to be safe in HIV uh, uh, patients is encouraging for the future treatment of this form of uh, morbidity that is very prevalent uh, particularly in this region. So I'll finish there by putting up my acknowledgement slide because I did none of this work. Uh, all these people here uh, at the Kirby and at our various collaborators uh, did all the work. Thank you very much. Thank you.